So, you have one of these, and you have one of these. What kind of cabling do you need to hook it all together? Something like this? Or maybe this is a little bit too light. How about something like this? Maybe this is what I need. Or, or how about jumper cables? I already have jumper cables. Maybe I can just hook these up. Now, that's probably too long. Maybe, uh, maybe I need to make my own cable. Something nice and short, like this. That should work. Or, you know what? Maybe I can just use something little like this. I mean, this might be adequate. Or, I've got extension cords. These can handle 1500 watts, right? So, I can just cut the ends off of here and, uh, and use this cord to hook up to my inverter. I, I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? Or, or maybe, I'm, maybe I'm overthinking all of this. And I can just use something like this, just little alligator clips, and hook these up to my inverter and these up to my battery, and I should be... All right, well, that's not going to work. But I get this question a lot. What size cables do I need? So today, I'm going to take some time and go over how to choose cables for your inverter. Now, there are a lot of variables here. Is the installation permanent? Is it temporary? Are you going to be using something like this so that you can easily move it around? Or are you going to do something permanent with ring terminals, something like this? Uh, and for that matter, do you crimp these on? Do you solder them on? Uh, what kind do you get? These are pure copper. Maybe the steel ones are okay. Uh, there's all kinds of different variables. What battery types? How many batteries? Does it have top or side terminals? Which is better? Uh, for your particular application. How do you protect those from corrosion? Do you use fuses? How long do the, can the cables be? Uh, what, what do you need to meet building codes? All kinds of little things like that. I'm not going to cover any of that because this could turn into a fairly long multi-part series and I'm really not an expert on the subject. So I'm just going to be covering cabling. What gauge cable, what size cable, and how long for your particular inverter. I'll leave all of the connections and such up to you. Now, in this video, I'm going to be using the American wire gauge system, feet and pounds, because I live in the United States, and if I walked into a, an auto store and said, hey, old chap, I'm looking for a 20 mil jumper cable, uh, they would have no idea what to do. So I'd walk into that store and say, I want a 20 foot 2 gauge jumper cable, and they'd give me exactly what I want. So if you live elsewhere in the world where you use the metric system, good for you, but I don't, so I'm going to be using this system. What's usually a good place to start is to open up the box, grab the user manual, and read it. However, that doesn't always give you exactly the information that you're looking for. This is the manual for the X-Power 1500 inverter, and I'll open it up and see what they have to say about wire size. Here they say that the cabling needs to be less than 5 feet and number 2. Well. What if I wanted cables that were 8 feet? Does that mean I need to buy a different inverter? It doesn't tell you. It just says 5 feet number 2. Doesn't matter what battery type I have. What kind of 2 gauge cable should I buy? It doesn't tell you any of that. It really isn't all that helpful. And different manuals disagree. Over here I have a different company's inverter. Down here we can see the 2000 watt model from this company. And 2000 watts isn't all that much more than 1500. You can see that they say 10 feet or less of 2 watt cable. Now, 2 watt cable is extremely expensive. It's very heavy and it probably costs you at least 5 bucks a foot. So, that ends up being a lot of money. Why does this one need so much heavier cable? And besides, what if I put my inverter 3 feet away? Do I still need 2 watt? So, in general, the manuals are good guidelines and certainly you can just follow those guidelines, but I never do when I size cabling. I'm going to go over how I size cabling for inverters. There are two things that need to be considered when selecting a cable gauge. One of them is safety. If you select a cable that's too thin, it can overheat and enter what is called a thermal runaway situation. The warmer that a cable gets, the more resistance that it has. The more resistance that it has, the more heat it generates. And this is a positive feedback loop that can eventually start fires. So you want to be aware of that. And two is voltage drop. If the cable drops too much voltage between your batteries and your inverter, then your inverter won't run properly. And both of these are important and need to be considered separately. A cable that works great when it's 5 feet long, doesn't overheat, and has an acceptable voltage drop may not work if you make it 50 feet long. 
It still won't overheat, but the voltage drop will be so great that you won't be able to use your inverter. So you would need a much heavier cable for that instance. And likewise, just because a two-foot cable has an acceptable voltage drop in an application, it doesn't mean it won't overheat and start a fire. So you need to be aware of both factors. The first thing that you need to do is figure out how many amps your system is going to draw. Now, that's pretty easy when it comes to inverters because they say right on them, 1500 watts. So this inverter, long term, will only be able to draw about 150 amps. A 12 volt inverter draws about 10 amps per 100 watts, so 1500 watts, take off one zero, you have 150 amps. That makes it pretty easy. If it's, if it's a 24 volt inverter, you cut that number in half, but in any case, you want to know how many amps. 150 in this case. So we're going to size our cable for 150 amps. But it's not quite that simple either. Because if I hook this up to an automotive battery or something, that battery won't be able to supply 150 amps long enough to actually overheat anything. Because you'd have to run this current through the cable for 20 minutes or so before it would overheat in most cases. And the battery just isn't capable of doing that. So there are some instances where you may not have to size the cable as heavy as this amp draw may indicate. Um, I wouldn't ever recommend doing that, but I do it all the time in my applications because I know that I'm not going to be running it continuously, especially in temporary applications. But uh, that's up to you. I'll leave it up to you to make sure that you're safe in what you do. But for this application, I'm going to say 150 amps. Now the other thing to keep in mind is the surge rating of your inverter. And I'm not going to go into how surge ratings work on inverters because that's a complicated and somewhat controversial subject. But I will just mention that most inverters have at least a very limited amount of surge capability. So this particular one I know has very little. It has about 2,000 watts uh, surge. And at 2,000 watts it has to briefly, for maybe only half a second or so, but briefly, draw 200 amps to get that uh, 2000 watt surge. So really when I size my cables for voltage drop, for heat I need to size them for 150 amps, for voltage drop I need to size them for 200 amps. Now I have another inverter that's a 2000 watt inverter. I need to size that one for 200 amps for cable heating, but that particular inverter can surge to 4000 watts. So I would need to size it for 400 amps in terms of voltage drop. So we need to find specifications for wire sizes to know how to size it. So just go to your favorite search engine, type in American wire gauge, uh, table, usually a table is the most useful format for this, and I'm also going to type in pounds because I'll show you why in the future, but I want to know how much this wire weighs. And of course it tries to sell me something. But uh, let's just click on one of the links here. <clears throat> and here we have a table of wire gauge information. And this is the table that you want to use. Um, you can use whatever reference you want, but this is just one example of a table that can be used for this information. A good table gives you a wire gauge, a diameter, uh, feet per ohms, pounds per foot, and other things. Amps and such also is on here, but uh, a good place to start is a table like this. Now I've actually pulled up a different table here because it's easier to illustrate for the particular purpose that I'm going to be talking about here. But first, let's pick a wire that is heavy enough so that it won't overheat if run at 150 amps continuously. And what you want to look at is NEC wire ampacity. And it's rated at uh, different temperatures depending on the insulation class. And these are extremely safe numbers. You can exceed these pretty safely in most cases. So generally, I just go with the 90C insulation rating because I know from experience that that's a very, very safe. Um, for example, we'll go down to 4 gauge. So over here we have 4 gauge wire, read the table across, and it says 95 amps <clears throat> is its ampacity with 90 degrees Celsius uh, insulation. But I know from experience that I can draw 100 amps out of a 4 gauge cable indefinitely and it only gets a little bit warm. So using the NEC ampacity at 90C is a good safe, uh, safe rule of thumb. Now if you want to run this by wood, something combustible, or through insulation, then you need to be a lot more careful. But 
That's rarely done with inverters. So in this case we have 150 amps. We'll go over here, find 150 amps, go across, and I need one gauge cable. Now the manual said two gauge, if you remember, yet that's only good for 130 amps. So that's why I say the manuals aren't always the best places to start. If you have a two gauge cable and you run it continuously, especially if you have it in a, uh, in a location where it's running through something that insulates the wire, where there's no airflow next to something combustible, this actually could be somewhat dangerous to follow the manual. So you do want to look at that pretty closely. It also depends on how you plan on using it. If you know that you're not going to put a 1500 watt load on it indefinitely, then, well, you can probably get by with a thinner wire. But this is how you choose the wire size for thermal reasons, for safety reasons. So we looked at the wire ampacity, and we chose to go with a 2 gauge wire. It may be a little bit marginal from a safety standpoint, but it is what the manual recommends, and I'm just going to use that as an example here. So that's the first part of the equation. Now we have wire that's safe to use. The second part is voltage drop. Now where, where do we go for voltage drop? Well, we go right back to that table that we were just looking at. And we're going to go to the 2 gauge wire, since that's what we selected to use. Come over here to copper resistance and we're going to look at the ohm per milliohms per foot column and this is about 0.16 so we have 0.16 milliohms per foot 